Zoom. So um, that goes for all of you as well. Thank you. All right, first up, here we go with the glasses. The Wake Bus Rapid Transit Station Design Public Art Branding and Public Engagement. David? All right, good morning. I might be a little rusty too, so I'm not used to seeing everybody in person, but uh, I'll go ahead and get started. I know we got a lot of information to cover, uh, but going to, good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm David Eatman with the Transportation Department. Uh, today, the BRT team will be reviewing the system elements of the BRT program. Mr. Luke Volkmar with Neighboring Concepts will cover station design and art integration. Luke has uh, been leading our architectural design for the stations. Uh, Ms. Cherie Gibson will cover our branding strategy as well as our public engagement efforts that have happened to date. Then I'll provide some closing remarks. Um, if I could go to, I think, two slides. I'm sorry, I got behind. I'm doing slides, so I'm rusty. My apologies. Um, just as a quick overview, I think everybody's probably familiar with this map by now, but um, just thinking about New Bern Avenue, we actually, well, all four BRT corridors are part of the Wake Transit Plan. And uh, we'll start with New Bern Avenue, but that's at 60% design, and Council during general session today will receive an update on that 60% design, so you'll get detailed information um, about that process. Um, our southern corridor, uh, we certainly have an LPA, um, a locally preferred alternative for that corridor, and we expect FTA to accept that into project development, hopefully in the next 30 to 40 days. Uh, so we're looking uh, anxiously for that. Um, our western corridor is actually in project development. Um, we're approaching 10% design. And with that 10% design, we are anticipating um, going out for our ratings application in August, late August. Um, as you may remember, our ratings application, um, if we receive a medium or better, um, we are eligible for federal funding. So that should be going out this August, um, which is not far away at all. Uh, and then our northern corridor, um, that actually says planning complete, but that should be uh, planning ongoing. Um, we will be looking at a new study for the new corridor or for the northern corridor um, this fall. Uh, we'll be kicking that off as quick as we can. Uh, we really wanted to rethink about uh, what that corridor could be between Six Forks Road and Capitol Boulevard and what are the best elements that could be in place. Uh, so really talking about today's uh, presentation. So what is today's focus? Well, certainly we're going to be talking about system standards uh, that will really define the look and the feel of all four BRT corridors. Um, we'll establish expectations for uh, design elements, such as, again, station design, uh, station facilities and amenities. What do you expect as system standards so you have a consistent feel uh, for the amenities across the network? Um, what is art integration in those facilities? How does that work? And then obviously branding of the system itself. So a lot of information to cover today. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Luke Volkmar to uh, go into station uh, design and uh, he'll be followed by Sherry Gibson. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Councilors. It's great to see you all in person. Um, thank you, David. So as David mentioned, the New Bern corridors at 60% design, being the first of the corridors that are being designed, um, it's really serving as a starting point for the standard scope of work. You know, what are the stations going to look like now? And then what are the stations for the follow-on corridors going to look like? How are standards going to be implemented? How are operations going to work? What bench are we going to use and make sure it's both maintainable now and then maintainable across the system in the future. So there's a lot that's kind of being figured out now at this first scope of work that's going to apply for work for potentially decades to come. So for the Wake BRT station design, there were five core goals that were, that were um, created back at the very start of the project. This idea of uniformity, um, that elements are consistent and standardized across the system that um, provides a higher level of service for those with disabilities. It gives them a consistent passenger experience. But it also it applies to branding, aesthetics, making sure the stations are recognizable across the system. 
scale. The, the stations need to scale up and down, be context and station appropriate, uh, especially with the neighborhoods that they're sitting within. There's an existing style for the, for the system. What does that look like? What does it look like for the public? What does that mean? These systems need to be maintained, easily maintained, both now and the future. And then it needs to be fiscally responsible. And I think as the project's gone on and we've seen issues with, um, with uh, like material shortages, um, issues with supply chains, that cost has also taken a new turn in the last year, making sure that we're specifying local, specifying products that give back into the tax base that helped generate this project for all of us. So the system standards, the naming convention scope of work, the names of the stations are going to be very consistent with the existing standard names. So they are roadway specific. So Edenton at Blount, Newburn at Tarboro. They're naming the inter or it's the name of the intersection, and that's consistent with the current standards that Go Raleigh uses. Um, the specific conceptual design scope of work for the standard for the stations. So this really kicked off in fall 2020. So that means we were entirely virtual at that time, but we were able to use um, interactive tools virtually to engage community stakeholders and engage our municipal partners and engage members of the public to make sure that we're getting that integrate that feedback that we really need. And the way that we work, we you know, we want really the design evolution of these to come from the public. We want it to come from the stakeholders. It's not something that we bring. It's almost something that we work through the process. And then the final design resolution that you'll see today is really from listening to them. So that process really took place over fall 2020 and then through the winter. So it, in, it in, included a visual preference survey, um, you know, understanding what people like, what people don't what they think of and materiality, what they think of when something's warm or cold, what's welcoming, what's safe. And then working through kind of design iterations that respond to those. And that took place from fall 2020 to really spring of this year. We came out in spring of 2021 with, um, during the second round of open houses that provided um, some vinyl design concepts and then additional surveys. And we'll see those survey responses soon. So in, in all that um, will be wrapped up kind of later this summer uh, once we get final feedback. Um, the BRT corridor is made up of six station types. So these are different station typologies and it's all dependent on what sort of neighborhood or what sort of context the stations are within. For example, in a residential neighborhood, you're gonna be worried about privacy both for the adjacent neighborhoods and then for um, the riders that is visual privacy that's also acoustical privacy but a station downtown you may not be worried so much about um, that acoustical privacy but you're going to be very interested in loading and access and making sure that commercial businesses aren't impacted by the, the um, by the placement of these stations. And that goes for during construction too, not just the, the, final, um, the final product. So there's these six different prototypes and we'll, we'll see what these look like, but they're meant to be kind of context sensitive and then responding to the, the different constraints in and around the, the stations. Um, so the actual amenities on the station, um, there's, there's seating, lots of weather protection, ADA accessible boarding, so these, these stations are actually raised. You can ride right onto the bus from a wheelchair. Digital real-time arrival signage. So it'll, it'll announce when the, the bus is arriving. Trash and recycling, off-board ticketing, emergency phones. We're working through the art integration piece, which we'll see. USB outlets for charging. We're also working on uh, making sure that these stations are solar ready right now. So that in the future, we'll have all the infrastructure in place now for future solar panels to be added to the tops of the stations and then be able to provide power back to the grid. Some examples of the, the virtual open house feedback that we received. So uh, the slides on the left are different lighting schemes. In the middle has different, um, uh, different forms for the roof of the, the station itself. And then um, over on the right side, you can see different color palettes. So 
trying to take this to the public and then also working through the, the various stakeholder entity groups that we've worked with. These were all examples of feedback. So this would be the, uh, the conceptual rendering for the Wake BRT Union Station. This would be on Wilmington Street. Um, and here would be an example where we're very um, concerned about the impact on local businesses. So looking at the station itself, um, there's a lot of transparency, both from the roadway to uh, the businesses in back. There's access from the back side of the station. Sometimes that, back, that access is limited to the ends. Um, it's much more kind of open and porous than what some of the other stations are that you'll see. Um, this would be an intermodal station. So as you work your way out of, kind of the downtown Raleigh, um, this would be on one of the neighborhood streets um, outside of the urban core. But this would be adjacent to the multi-use path. So the project includes a multi-use path. It's 10 feet wide um, for biking and for um, kind of that first mile, last mile connectivity that you see. Um, so this means that, you know, there's additional amenities in and around the station area for, for bikes, for scooters, kind of that, you know, all those other things that you think of for transit. Um, conceptual rendering of the suburban station. So this would be one in a residential neighborhood. There's windscreens that are across the whole back side of the station. So there's much more visual privacy here. Um, those windscreens are we're looking at as almost a blank canvas for artwork right now. So while you see that there's glass in there, there's glass that's intended to be um, one of our canvases for the art program. Access from this is completely at the ends. So there's no access from the back. And then we're very interested in acoustical privacy here too, making sure that you know that noise and that audible audible signal is coming out into the roadway. And then finally, as you, as you get out into a, a divided highway, this would be the Split Island Station. So, you know, what does this station look like in a in a roadway with a median? Here, we're very interested in pedestrian safety. So, you know, in a in a roadway environment like this, how do we make sure that the stations are safe? How do we make sure that they're, they're well lit, that at night you don't feel trapped, you don't feel isolated? So, you know, the, these stations are a little bit unique in both providing protection against vehicular cars and then against, you know, just that, that idea of feeling safe, especially at night. And then as, as you get furthest out, we have our peripheral stations. So these are kind of our light stations. They have a much lighter footprint. They're about half the size of the others. Um, and they take up less right-of-way space. But they're at the peripheral or at the very end of the, the station. So you can see what those look like. All the amenities are the same. So same amenity palette that we saw before. There's just less waiting area. And then finally, for the art and uh, residence program, we've been working with Derek Culture. Um, she's been awesome. If you all met her, she's got a great personality and just brings life to the project. Um, so she's been leading the community effort to uh, think about what is art? What does art mean for both the community? How do we speak to legacy and you know the, the, the neighborhood that we're within? Um, and then, you know, what palettes do we have? So what canvases are there as part of the, the Wake BRT project that we can apply art to? Some of that sculptural, some of that, you know, would be a painting, so we need a vertical surface. Sometimes it's tiles or, you know, patterns within the concrete. But she's working through what all that means right now, and we've been working kind of right alongside her through her process to identify those aspects in the project. So that's ongoing, you know, we're certainly not done. We probably have a, a year of work still to do with her, um, but it's, it's been very enjoyable. And you can see what some of those examples look like on the right. So Sheree will come um, up now and speak through the branding and some of the open house project. Thank you. Good morning. So yeah, I'm here today to just cover on the public engagement side of this project, and we've been in process for about a year now, which is hard to believe. Um, the goal of our engagement process was to be as inclusive as possible and to make sure that the residents and businesses along New Bern um, understood what the impacts of the project were and they understood the opportunities for them to engage. And obviously during COVID, we were impacted in our ability not to um, be able to 
um, meet in person. So we were able to overcome those challenges. But I want to talk about the branding. That's the other part of the public engagement process, the big important logo that's going to be on the vehicles and on the stations, the branding piece. So we started the data collection process of the branding uh, market data research process um, in last summer. So we did a, a comprehensive a review of other BRT systems in um, equally um, e equal municipalities across the country to see what they did, how their process went, how their brands differed from other transit brands. Uh, we created a technical committee to, uh, just to focus on branding with representatives of all of the major stakeholders. Um, and they were really instrumental in working with us to advance the work of the branding. We launched uh, several surveys during the summer, uh, the public survey to ask people, you know, how, how do you feel about BRT? What do you want it to evoke? What kind of emotions come to mind when you think of transit service? Uh, and got lots of great feedback over the summer. Uh, in the spring, we started uh, uh, concepts um, and started to develop um, naming conventions for the system and started to develop actual logos and how it would work, work together. Uh, we are at the process now, and you'll see a little further down in my uh, remarks here wh what where we ended up but we are um, happy to say that we're in final branding design um, and um, and look forward to your to your feedback Let's see. Oh, I'm going backwards all right so this is a little bit of, of about the public survey we did a survey in the fall and we had over 500 responses it was wonderful on publicinput.com we also had three stakeholder listening sessions with 60 percent participants and these were smaller more intimate um, conversations on zoom with with very with various stakeholders um, to get their uh, you know verbal feedback and and com comments on on the process in the fall we had our first virtual open house and Luke alluded to that this was our um, online open house if you will where we had all of the information and opportunities for people to give us feedback uh, the key themes that emerged from this first phase were, you know, there was uh, support for the existing GO brand. Um, there was lots of comments about the GO brand, the existing transit brand here in the uh, Raleigh area, the Wake area. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we kept that in mind as we moved into the next phase, that there was a lot of goodwill and a lot of affinity for the for the brand. Um, it's a well-known brand, an established brand, so we didn't want to, um, we wanted to make sure that we kept that in mind. The other was that we wanted to develop a bold and inviting color palette. Um, most of the participants in the survey said they wanted something, you know, bold and unique and clean. They wanted something that was really going to differentiate um, BRT from, you know, other um, transit and transportation um, options in the area. So we found that this was a great opportunity to, you know, really be bold. So these are the concepts that we have developed thus far. Um, we refined the concepts using the feedback from the Branding Technical Committee, and we had great meetings with them and had an interactive tool where they could come in and provide feedback and give us comments on different iterations. Uh, but the name is uh, Go Plus, and uh, it, it is a derivation of your Go brand, and the plus is plus. It's plus transit it's plus the region it's plus options the color is orange and you'll see here with the chevron uh, the traditional chevron that you um, are accustomed to seeing with the the go brand so the next steps are to analyze the public feedback we uh, introduced these concepts in our spring open house and got a lot of feedback on those uh, we will develop the final recommendations and guidelines so once it's finalized and everyone agrees upon it we will develop a, a system a standard guide where how the logo will be used how it will um, you know the rules and the standards and and all of that the fonts the color palettes that go with that so just to update you on the public engagement we did have a spring open house that just ended last month. It was online, obviously, since we can't meet in person, but we had uh, videos on all of the major topics, the artists in residence, the branding, all of the uh, corridors that are under development. Uh, we had a great uh, live Q&A where the team was able to be on 
on a Zoom meeting and interact uh, in person with with people who had questions. They could come on and ask questions about anything. So we had uh, three of those divided between the corridors and topics. And we had three corridor surveys and got over 350 responses. So we had wanted to make sure that people had an ability to respond to the corridor that interested a interested them the most, but they also had access to um, any information about BRT. And this is just a um, summary of the outreach to make sure that people understood how to get involved. Uh, the postcards, which is very, it's just standard for the city to send out. Um, we were happy that we were able to extend the reach of the postcards to include apartments um, this go round. Uh, we had several meetings with the downtown businesses, the DRA, Downtown Raleigh Alliance, to make sure that their interests and in parking and access were, have been addressed. Uh, 15 stakeholder committee meetings, and we also um, got interest from Poe Elementary School, um, and Dare Coulter was able to go out and work with the students there on some art. Um, so we have had lots of interest along the corridor for various um, various organizations. We also had a very um, a concerted effort to reach out to faith-based organizations and social service uh, especially during this time of shut-in where people weren't necessarily able to meet in person to make sure that they could help us bridge and make those connections, use their mailing distributions to get the word out. The non-virtual component is what we call like non-virtual, um, is we developed some boards to put out along the corridor. Um, these were really interesting. They're very large boards, and we asked some, some of the survey questions that we had online. But we had stickers, and you can see where people could go on and answer questions and respond. And we put these strategically along the corridor, particularly at um, bus shelters where people are, at, eye level so if people could directly interact with the polling. We had um, you know, a map of the corridor and a brochure and information to follow up if, you, if people wanted to have um, get more information. Uh, we also had yard signs and an RTA uh, committee was very instrumental in helping us get the yard signs out. Um, and developing, um, you know, making sure that, that people had them. But the, the 10 polling boards were really successful. You can see that uh, people were very inner and involved. And it's interesting if you, if you um, zero down on the location of the boards, what kind of responses um, you got. So we have all of that data available. Okay. I think that's, yeah. I think that does it for me. So, um, but all in all, we're really excited about the um, the approach, and we think that um, we're going to continue with the engagement, particularly with the with the branding. We still have uh, work to do to um, finalize the the final brand and and plan to do another uh, virtual open house or maybe you know in person next. So, thank you. I just wanted to say I love the idea of the boards at the stations that was great Thank you. very creative all right so um uh, final two slides here uh time has uh, flown on us but um uh, while we're entering 30 percent or the final 30 percent design uh, don't forget that station area planning is certainly underway uh, within newburn avenue corridor uh, I don't necessarily need to uh, read all of the bullets of uh, of the slide here but, but certainly as far as next steps uh, um, in-person and online events will be forthcoming uh, along the corridor. Um, really trying to create a story of Newburn Avenue um, as they uh, interact with uh, different neighborhoods and, and certainly uh, Newburn is very uh, unique as it has uh, commercial areas and, and neighborhoods. Uh, but also um, they'll be compiling housing and an affordable housing inventory um, along the corridor. And uh, also, one of the important things is, is they'll be doing an infrastructure uh, review as well. So where um, can we make improvements to that first mile, last mile uh, connectivity to the station areas? So certainly more to come on station area planning. Um, and then, so uh, for our design update, next steps, uh, 
that is really at your one o'clock meeting today. Uh, Engineering Services will be providing a detailed overview of the actual design, uh, along with uh, Raleigh Water will also be uh, providing a, a brief presentation, I believe, during that um, time as well. Um, myself, as well as the team, are here to answer any questions. Uh, so um, thank you for your time today. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have questions? I saw you first. Councilor Branch, and then you, Councilor Cox. So the bulk of my questions I want to save for the later session, um, but I do just want to say thank you for what you're doing and the committee that you pulled together um, as far as working through um, the stationary and planning and things of that nature. But I will have some questions more in detail um, at our afternoon session. Councilmember Cox. <laughs> So uh, I echo uh, Councilor Branch's uh, comments, and uh, but uh, one of the things, two things I didn't see in the design, uh, the designs that were presented were accommodations for scooters, and accommodations for our expanding bike share program, and obviously people will probably use, could use either of those in order to get to and from a bus station, and I was wondering if there's opportunity to incorporate those elements into the, into uh, the designs. We do have some bike share within the, uh, the programming um, in the corridor. I cannot just rattle off the locations of exactly where they may be, but we can certainly follow back up with those. As far as scooters, they are an integral part of uh, a first mile, last mile in our current environment, and uh, we realize that as well. Uh, so certainly with the multi-use path and uh, as we develop those edges, you know, where we, can we integrate those, uh, those technologies, uh, I think is very important. I'll uh, certainly check with the, de the design team, but uh, I think we have certainly thought about those things and uh, we can report back out. Yeah, like a design element, like for just for parking or positioning scooters mm -hmm. uh, at the stations so that they're just not left anywhere uh, would be good, a good idea, I think. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was, did you? Sure. Thank you, Madam. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Mr. Walgmer, I believe, mentioned this about the sustainability uh, aspects, components of, of, of the sustainability office has been involved um, looking at this as we look at our uh, climate goals and how to reach them. This is a this is a part of it. And uh, I think I appreciate you mentioning the, the materials, uh, the sourcing of those materials, uh, obviously proximity, but also where they come from and what type of materials uh, are they reuse, recycle, the, all those type of things. So that's something that um, I appreciate that y'all are looking at and working on and uh, anything um, and look forward to hearing more about that as you get more specific on what uh, what the design is going to be and what it's going to look like thank you thank you mayor so um, I had a question about public art uh, I think it was maybe six or eight slides in there was pictures with percentages on them I didn't understand what those percentages meant it wasn't just wasn't clear to me was that percentage of first choice or can you give me a little context on that i can't remember the context of the slide my fault that was uh, you want it so, okay. sorry we'll uh okay. we'll answer the yes that's the slide yeah so uh it's not clear to me what these percentages meant so the artisan residence program provided these images over on the right as part of the virtual open house, trying to engage the public to see what art integration they were most interested in. So looking at the feedback on the right, essentially said you know 56 percent were in were interested in some sort of horizontal pavers. That's the pattern that you see kind of at the bottom there, and then. Um, for the windscreens, you can see there were 27% of participants were interested in that. So it was this is actually specific feedback from the online virtual open house relative to art integration. Okay, may I have one more? Yeah. So, so were, was this like a, a choose one of these or pick as many as you like? Okay, that's all right. You yeah. can you can follow up later yeah. on. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, David, and thank you to the 
thank you to the team for um, presenting today. We'll look forward to seeing more this afternoon at our regular session. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have um, Bill King um, from the Downtown Raleigh Alliance. You might recall that Bill was with us um, to kind of go over when we did the listening session for downtown. And one of the things that he had mentioned was the public realm study that the DRA had completed. We we're asking Bill to come back today to kind of fill us in on where that study went and um, some of the key points. Thank you, Bill. All right, thank you all so much. I'm Bill King, President and CEO of the Downtown Raleigh Alliance, and thank you for your time. Uh, I am gonna walk you through uh, some of the results from our public realm study. Uh, I just want to give a couple of notes ahead of time. This is a, a pretty dense study. This ended up being a 40-page study. Some of this gets pretty technical. I'm not going to hit all of those points uh, in this session in the interest of time. Uh, so I'm going to try to walk you through that. So you may see some slides that look pretty dense, um, but uh, we, that's in the report, and uh, there'll be a lot more opportunity to digest that later. Um, so just want to give that note. I also want to start out with a little bit of what is the public realm. So I think that can be uh, sort of challenging to get your head around. But the simplest way to think of it is it's that uh, space between our buildings. It's our streets, our sidewalks, our plazas, our parks. And obviously public space like this has been very valuable for the last year during the pandemic. It's where we found exercise. It's where we found community. It's where we expressed ourselves. And it's part of where we've been able to get through this together. So it's a really important part of downtown and our community. And it's part of why we looked at it. Um, but I do want to note this is part of a larger strategy. So by no means is this public realm study the only thing we're looking at in terms of bringing downtown back. So obviously we're focused on a lot of different areas. We covered those in the last work session around small business support, safety and security, encouraging the safe return of our employees, new entrepreneurship opportunities, and of course reintroducing downtown to our community through activations and marketing. So there's a lot going on. This is part of a larger strategy in order to bring people back to downtown, but there's going to be a lot of work over the next couple of years to bring our downtown fully back. So our objectives in this public realm study were pretty fundamental. We want to bring more people downtown by understanding how we use our public realm to re-engage and re-energize downtown. And so we really have uh, two main areas here. The first was looking at outdoor dining and curbside zones. So we focused on that because there's a pretty immediate uh, issue there where obviously we're coming out of our COVID measures. Life is reopening here, uh, which is great and wonderful. A lot of these measures were temporary, both in their materials and their implementation. So we wanted to be able to give good stakeholder feedback to you all as a council and to staff on what does the downtown community think about these measures? Do they want to see these continue? If so, what would that look like? And then we also took this opportunity to talk about activations and events. So how do we use our public spaces to benefit downtown and attract a broad array of stakeholders? What would bring people downtown safely? So those were the main areas of focus. I do wanna note there's a lot of other public realm topics we heard about during the study. I'm, I'm pointing these out to show that there's a lot of places we could have taken the study. Uh, obviously pedestrian improvements, bicycle infrastructure, cleanliness, larger scale events, safety and security. Each of these could be their own study. Some of these things have already been studied. Uh, many of these things are really sort of above our scope and scale, uh, but there's a lot that goes into the public realm. So I just wanna acknowledge that we kept this focused on those things that are sort of immediate and urgent in order to get the most near-term wins for downtown. This was our process, this is our timeline. This was a very, very accelerated timeline. Keep in mind, we have a small team at DRA. Our economic development team is three folks. Uh, they did a tremendous job. I wanna give a big heads up. Uh, thank you to Will Gaskins, our Director of Economic Development. He's here today, did an amazing job guiding this project to the finish line. We got this done in less than two months, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, as you can see, we had a, a robust community engagement strategy. We did 20 listening sessions, residents, businesses, employees, staff, um, we did event producers, cultural organizations. We reached out to organizations that have never programmed downtown or really been invited to downtown to see what they thought. We worked with Innovate Raleigh. We did an annual survey with over a thousand responses. We do that every year uh, as part of our contract, uh, but we had a tremendous response there. A public meeting to sort of show some of our ideas and get feedback. But we also did outreach to less digitally connected communities, uh, such as our affordable senior communities. You think about um, the Sir Walter apartments on Fayetteville Street. They are right in the middle of the event footprint. So we thought it was really important to hear from them as well. Um, and we didn't think they would necessarily be quite as connected in some of these other avenues. So uh, we did that as well as a peer study for some processes and ideas from other cities. 
So I'm going to walk you through these sections. Uh, we'll, we'll talk through first the expansion of outdoor dining. Um, then we'll go through curbside pickup zones. And finally, we will touch on small scale activations and that's divided into a few sections. So uh, just a quick uh, overview of your previous actions here. Fundamentally, what happened during 2020 was a major expansion of the private use of public space, PUPS. Um, so premises were expanded to be in front of neighboring properties with permission. So that meant a restaurant could put tables and chairs in front of the neighboring building if they had permission from the owner. Uh, a lot more in-street outdoor dining was allowed uh, with relaxed standards and fees. I do want to note the term parklet. Uh, we use that a lot for these. Technically speaking, a parklet is a public use of public space. So in this study, we've tried to differentiate that. That should be a different process. Parklets are wonderful and great. There's a little bit more, particularly as you go permanent here, nuance here in terms of what you want to regulate from standards, aesthetics, uh, activities. And so we really talk more about uh, expanded outdoor dining in street, which is a little bit wonkier, but I do want to keep that differentiated because I think conflating the two terms can be a little bit challenging as you, as you look to potentially make these permanent. Pedlets were permitted and improved. You think of Martin Street uh, in front of Garland and Capital Club where you move the pedestrian path into the street. Expansion was done in a really expeditious manner. And of course, all this was done with the North Carolina Alcohol Beverage Control Commission, allowing for this temporary relaxation of standards. Uh, we did do a lot of feedback on the expansion of outdoor dining. Uh, it is overwhelmingly popular. So you can see 85% of our participants in our uh, survey, for example, want to see more sidewalk extensions implemented in downtown uh, to expand outdoor dining space. Uh, and only 8% didn't want to see that. So uh, that's great. It shows strong support for this. Uh, we also heard a lot of good feedback on the flexibility and responsiveness. Uh, those are really appreciated by city staff, and I will just say city staff did a tremendous job. Um, I think really set the standard on getting this done uh, for downtown last year. Um, streamlined and simple instructions are important. These business owners are very often uh, a bit intimidated by uh, design and planning and regulations, and so um, the more that instructions were simplified for them, the easier it was. Uh, safety barricades, you look at the orange and white jersey barriers. Everyone agreed that's necessary, it's important. They don't look great, so there was a lot of interest in finding a way to improve the aesthetics if these are gonna be permanent. And then obviously the fee structure was discussed. Uh, during the temporary measures, there was no fee. Prior to that, if you wanted to do a parklet, you had to pay for parking encumbrance and other things, and there was some feedback that that was really challenging and prohibitive for doing these uh, in long term. We also did a peer city review. Uh, we looked at cities around the southeast as well with similar regulatory environments. Uh, the biggest takeaway is a lot of other cities are looking at what we're doing as well, which is trying to find a way to make these more permanent. And so the areas they're looking at are things like maintenance and safety, aesthetics, cost, and equity as well, making sure that um, it's equitable for businesses to be able to do this across the spectrum. I'm not going to hit everything on this slide. I'm showing you this to show you that we did a lot of peer city research. So there's a lot of other cities in a similar spot, which allows us to borrow ideas and see how they've done it. So other cities have established guidance documents. They've established regulations. They've done a lot of this research as well around um, amplification, the width of the pedestrian corridor, the type of materials we should use, ADA access. Um, where the boundary should be, inspections, insurance. So there's a lot of opportunity to use that work. We have that in our report, something we're happy to provide to staff as well, but there's a lot of other guidance, very similar in line with what we did here. Not a lot of surprises in this, but it was helpful to sort of check what we did against some of our peer cities. So I'm gonna uh, walk you through a few of our recommendations here for the expansion of outdoor dining. Um, this is our media section, so there will be 15 recommendations, so bear with me for a moment. The first one is fundamental. We, we would advocate for a clear process for the permanent extension of outdoor dining premises on sidewalks and in street. And so I think there's a great opportunity here. It benefits our businesses, our consumers liked it across the all stakeholder groups. So we would advocate for you all looking at that. Um, allowing outdoor dining premises to expand to neighboring frontages had broad support. So that is if you can put sidewalks, uh, tables and chairs on the sidewalk in front of your neighboring building and they've agreed to it. Uh, it's a pretty common sense solution and opportunity. Um, creating clear and attainable safety and aesthetic standards. So this is something that there's a broad agreement amongst businesses, residents, consumers, that we need to make sure we do have standards on these things. So um, obviously the, the prevailing need in the past year was to get this done quickly, right? Now, we, as if you're going to move into permanent, you, you do need to look at standards around materials, 
making sure that everyone's clear on what makes these safe, particularly in street. You think about that, there's still traffic moving nearby. I'm making sure we feel good about how our public realm looks. The key here is making the standards really clear and identifiable. So businesses get, again, intimidated and confused if they're having to figure out if this planter work or not. Is it a planter? Is it a curb stone? What is it that works for this? So the more you can make those standards obvious, the better. We saw some great examples, particularly out of Atlanta and Dallas and Los Angeles, where their guides are really, really simple and straightforward on here's what you can do. Here's how you do it. Here are the steps. So that's really, really important. We did advocate for considering a meeting with some of these outdoor dining permit holders to discuss standards and draft guidance to make sure that it makes sense and that there's good feedback uh, in both directions. Um, we advocate for considering a process that perhaps allows a two to three year pilot. What we heard from businesses is they understand the need for standards. That comes with investment. To make that investment, they'd like a little bit of certainty that they can keep these for more than a few months at a time. So that is important. Obviously, a lower fee structure is something we heard a lot of. These are businesses still getting back on their feet. Centralizing authority and decision making, um, you know, in one city department, you, you, if you're having to go to lots of different departments for different questions on different parts of your application, that's tough. I thought that was a real win during this process is that uh, the Office of Special Events took that on and did a, a great job on that. So we appreciate that. So having sort of one clear point of contact is really, really helpful. Um, some of what we heard is a notification system for property owners. Again, the goal of the last year was expediency, get it done. Um, but there could be opportunities where at least notifying a certain radius of nearby property owners that these are going in permanently allows them to comment on that. So if there is a concern around the loss of access or something like that, it is appropriate to let people have that opportunity to express that. And so um, how that's weighed uh, is to be determined, but I think there's an opportunity there to make sure there's notification. Consistent hours of operation uh, with the indoor and the outdoor. So businesses did tell us when they have to close the outdoor earlier than the indoor, that gets really difficult. Patrons get irritated. Then they spill out into the rest of the public realm that is no longer regulated the same way, which actually can create worse issues around noise and disruption, which flows into our next recommendation, which is uh, there's no need to allow amplified noise on outdoor dining expansions. That will create a disruption and businesses were fine with that. They understand that. So that isn't necessary. Heating elements is another good one. We, we saw kind of inconsistent um, use of heating elements throughout the winter. Some really were safe. I think some probably could have improved their safety. So there's an opportunity there to clarify that standard. A maintenance agreement, I think is important, right? These are in the public realm. So you wanna make sure that we have a clear standard on when are these being cleaned? What does that look like? Securing the tables and chairs and making sure that's very clear and obvious. We mentioned insurance requirements. There's some peer city research on that. That's great. ADA accessibility is critical. We cannot have our public realm be less accessible because of these. So making sure that that standard is high is critical. Um, depending on where that sort of threshold ends up with standards, obviously, again, businesses are still getting on their feet. So the opportunity for some sort of a placemaking grant program to fund outdoor dining expansion materials and elements. We did this with the Duke Energy Grant last year. It was very successful. It's very clear. You can do a reimbursement type grant. Businesses have skin in the game. You require a match, but that might be an opportunity depending on, again, where you put your standards at. And then long term, looking at the extension of sidewalk where appropriate, um, I would have a high threshold for that change. That's a pretty big change for your public realm, but that could be something to look at. So um, this is the full breadth of expansion of outdoor dining recommendations. There's a lot to get through. I think staff's done an amazing job on this, um, and uh, this will obviously take time to digest and, and figure out, but uh, there's a lot of great opportunity here to expand outdoor dining. So curbside pickup zones, um, this has been a tremendously successful program. These were down within a week of the pandemic, which is amazing. There's over 85 of these zones in downtown. And I'm not sure if we recognize how much this was seen nationally as a model. Not many other cities got this done at the level, the speed we did. So I think uh, staff deserves a lot of credit for that. So quick deployment, low cost, maximum flexibility. That's why this was successful. Customers love it because it was easy. And obviously, frankly, people don't love paying for parking. Our survey participants said it made it a lot more likely they were gonna frequent a downtown business. There were some headaches. Enforcement of these is challenging, right? So enforcement is already stretched right now uh, for our department. So it, it is challenging to figure out is somebody here legitimately or not. Uh, and the need for these zones varies significantly. So I'll, I'll walk through that in just a second. 
So what we found is when we talked to businesses, some businesses are already phasing out their use of these. Sit down dining businesses and bars uh, have less interest in these permanently. So they're focused on serving the dining rooms now. Lunch oriented restaurants, grab and go restaurants such as pizza and sandwiches still have a strong interest in these. These help them a lot, makes it easy. Think about that. They're a little bit less experiential, a little bit more about convenience. That sort of applies to retailers as well. Those that were more experiential, a little less interested. Those that are convenience, definitely interested. So there was a sense that eliminating them altogether in the near term might not be the best thing. But I think there's an opportunity here to look at a few changes. So some were open to shared zones so that block faces aren't eat up with curbside zones. If you have businesses near each other, you have a shared zone. There's an opportunity there that I think could be really beneficial. We heard a lot about the durability of signage and visible markings. So to make this program so successful, it had to go out you know, quickly using cones and signs. Obviously, if you're gonna have a long-term program, you wanna make sure that it's a little bit more durable. And then the time limit could also be adjusted as well. So we heard that um, in some of our feedback. So our recommendations on curbside parking uh, would be to institute a new application process for businesses still interested in having these. So I think you'll find that some businesses no longer need them. So a number of them will be phased out, which will make it easier to manage. But some of those will, and there's an opportunity to collect data on usage and timing, things like that. I think that application process will allow the opportunity for shared zones to be identified where neighbors are happy to do so. And again, shared zones need to be pretty close to businesses within a half block visible of the business. Otherwise, they cease to be uh, all that useful. More durable design for these zones that utilizes permanent signage and even considering painting zones. So consumers told us they oftentimes accidentally messed this up because they'd park in a zone, didn't realize it was a zone because they didn't see the cones, didn't understand it. So if we're going to keep these, making these a bit more visible, that I think will also help on the enforcement side of things a little bit more if consumers understand that. There was some interest in a temporary deployment of cones during the holidays to facilitate shopping. So again, a lot of stores don't need these long-term, but it could be a fun way to pump holiday shopping, make it easier. And obviously just continued flexibility. What we found is that we're still in a state where again, these are really helpful for some businesses, less so for others. So flexibility uh, is critical here. So the final portion of my uh, presentation is on small scale activations and events. Um, And so really this is a great opportunity to bring people back downtown We focused on ways to make it easier to bring people back downtown through small scale activation. We focused on small scale because frankly, downtown is historically good at large scale. We know how to close Fayetteville Street and bring a lot of people on. We are a little bit more inconsistent on how to use our other public spaces. And there's a lot of opportunity to bring in new organizations, new people, new diversity, if we can find a way to activate our public realm that way. And frankly, we can do it a lot faster. To throw a bluegrass event requires years of work to throw a you know, smaller event, we can pull that off faster, which helps downtown get back faster. So we focused on that. We looked at some infrastructure and investments in public spaces that could help. And then we also um, have a few ideas for public space activation. Um, so we heard from a lot of our um, uh, businesses, residents, groups, um, that you know the permitting process is very well suited for large scale events, but there might be an opportunity to tweak it for smaller scale. Um, And for those who are doing smaller scale events, they tend to be a little bit less experienced. So clearer guidance, charts, and training helps them understand how to get through the process. We heard about security costs being challenging, the notification period being a little long, um, but we did hear that there is a sense that staff is extremely helpful. They are invested in success, and they feel like this is just a a little bit of a process tweak um, that could maybe help activate things in a different way. Um, So um, you can see there's an opportunity here. We looked at a lot of other peer cities. A number of peer cities, including Durham, have multiple processes for different scaled events, right? So if you have a big event, you go through one process. You have a smaller event, you go through another. And there are some clear triggers on that. So things like alcohol, how much of the street you're gonna close, the impact on city resources and attendance are some of those major triggers that will kick you into different processes depending on what you're trying to do. And that seems like a a potentially reasonable way to bring in some different activation, but make sure that we still take care of security and risk as well. We also saw some peer cities scale their security needs a little bit. So if you're not serving alcohol or if you're expecting a smaller crowd, your security or your police necessary might change a little bit. Uh, Security costs can be a, a, a heavy cost on a small scale event. This is just an example of a chart. This is from Austin. This is one of the more complicated processes we saw. This is a four tier. Again, Durham is a two tier. So um, there's a lot of different ways to, uh, to structure this. 
So in terms of the process, uh, in terms of making it easier for small scale activations, um, there could be an opportunity for a new application process, fee structure, and set of standards um, for small scale activations that allow for a little bit quicker approval process using those triggers, right? So looking at those things that trigger essentially risk um, as a way to figure out whether or not you go into a shorter process or a longer process. Um, training and guide to event hosts uh, to educate them on the process and requirements. Again, there's a, a type of event producer who thoroughly understands it in the city. And there's a lot who don't necessarily. And I think some opportunities there um, for training would make that a little bit easier. Pre-planned pre layouts for certain spaces, so a lot of them. We have sort of that in mind for Fayetteville Street, right? We do that for large-scale events. We could do that for some of our other spaces that would expedite the process a little bit, make it a little bit easier. And again, looking at that expense of security and barricades um, for smaller scale activations, depending on scale. So those are some tweaks potentially for the process. In terms of investments and in infrastructure, um, we heard from our stakeholders a lot of little things that could be done in our public spaces uh, in downtown that would make them a little bit easier to bring people in and welcome people. So um, there's some opportunities to invest in some of these spaces that I think could really position them a little bit differently. And the other thing we heard is that some of our public spaces um, are not necessarily playing to their strengths. So the best example I can give you is Market and Exchange Plaza, which it's very possible somebody's watching this and doesn't know where those plazas are. Um, we have programmed those plazas more than anyone else. They are basically somewhat narrow alleys. They are beautifully looking. They're great design. They're in a great location. They are challenging for the traditional event, right? Because one side can't see the other side very easily. But there's some opportunities those plazas present that are different, right? Some of the things you could do with those plazas that you can't do with other public spaces could be really cool in terms of some more dynamic public art, something that draws people down. You can use the elevation and the lights that are already hanging over it. That could be really neat. So we heard that there's some opportunities to reposition our public spaces. So some of our recommendations here. Um, there, there's some opportunities to invest in some basic infrastructure to better facilitate small scale activations uh, in public spaces. So shade was one of them. We do a lot of events in City Plaza uh, and more square shade can be a bit of a challenge for vendors and patrons, particularly during the summertime here in Raleigh. Uh, color and pop in public spaces is something we heard. So colorful furniture in City Plaza, for example, or in other public spaces. From our office workers, one of the neat things we heard was that if there was a little bit better Wi-Fi, doing outdoor meetings in places like City Plaza could be really neat. And that would be an opportunity to get people back, but also accommodate some of the behavioral changes we're seeing as people slowly get back into the public realm. PA and sound system we heard over and over, particularly from our music producers, that that can be a cost that's hard for them. But if there was something there that made that a little easier, they could program public spaces the way we have for noon tunes um, on behalf of the city of Raleigh. That could be a great opportunity. And then a screen capable of showing live sporting events. We get this request all the time. Um, hurricane playoff games, ACC basketball, World Cup. Uh, screens can't, projection screens don't work during the daytime, but unfortunately sporting events don't care about that. So it's very challenging to do those big large scale gatherings, um, which we get a lot of requests for. So there's an opportunity to invest in some basic infrastructure. Um, potentially creating a fund for covering basic cost of small scale activations, particularly with an eye towards equity of, there's a lot of different groups who are interested in coming downtown, who again, they've been a little intimidated by process and cost. There might be an opportunity to cover some of those basic costs. Again, keep your standards in a certain place, but allow for other groups to come in. I mentioned repositioning our downtown public spaces for specific activations. Marketing Exchange is a good one. You see that picture there of the umbrellas over the uh, street there. That's from Portugal, I believe. And you can see Marketing Exchange above it, right? It's not over a uh, traditional right of way with streets and, uh, or excuse me, with cars and, and things like that. Um, and there actually are some elements already hanging over it. What if we took these plazas and created something really dynamic with them? I think that'd be a way to take a use of the space that could be really cool. Union Station Plaza, although I know there could be some construction there, um, that's a plaza that, that doesn't have an enormous amount of foot traffic, so something that has a little bit more infrastructure could stay there. So a temporary, you know, one of those temporary <coughs> AstroTurf soccer fields could be there for a month, and it wouldn't be terribly disruptive <coughs> because it's not the front entrance to the station. City Plaza should be the place for consistent, regular activations, particularly aimed at office workers during the daytime. It has the largest density of office workers around it, so there's a great opportunity there. 
Um, creating an activations working group for coordination, communication, and amplification of existing and upcoming events is, is helpful. Uh, monthly coordination meeting, what we found is there's a lot going on. So you think about you know, everything that's going on in our parks, um, our convention center, and amphitheater, what we're doing. There's a lot of groups that are here working on this stuff, but we don't always uh, communicate well. The special events office does a tremendous newsletter that says every event that's happening downtown. Amplifying that would help a lot, reduce some of the duplication and uh, redundancy. Beautification efforts across our public realm. We heard this, something that is identifiable and, and I say branded, not branded in a corporate way, but the way that sunflowers at Dix Park are now very closely associated with Dix Park, you know to expect them. So this is a beautification effort beyond just sort of planters or something, something that sticks. And at downtown Atlanta, they did daffodils. So there's an opportunity to do something that draws people down, um, kind of in the way that Art and Bloom has at the Museum of Art, that could be really cool. And then wayfinding um, and other interventions, directing patrons to businesses at events. Businesses don't always feel like they benefit all that much from events. So opportunities to bring people from the event footprint into their spaces could be a really w easy way to get more and more business in our businesses. And then hiring a special events producer for a dedicated and coordinated series of programs in public spaces. Think about the Thursday night concert series that used to be in City Plaza, something that just kicks a little boost into downtown. DRA has done this. There's also a third party model that does this, but this is an opportunity for a small investment that could really kick things into gear. So this is a full public space investments infrastructure recommendations. Finally, I'm just gonna give you real quick a few ideas on programming and then I'll wrap it up. Um, so weekends are doing well in downtown. Weekdays could use more activation. We heard over and over again, consistency is important. When people don't know when the thing is, they don't come. So when they know something is every Saturday morning, they get it and it starts to build a behavior. And so consistency is super important. We also heard about interest in interactive and playful elements and needing to reach out to and encourage more diverse groups to program downtown. So there's sort of three buckets here in music and performances. We heard a lot of people miss those Thursday night concert series on City Plaza. Jazz in the Park is a model we see in a lot of other downtowns across the country. Um, we already are seeing great success with the lunchtime concert performances on City Plaza. Again, thanks to the Duke Energy Performing Arts Center staff for putting that together. Um, and we had a dance performance two weeks ago that had great attendance. People were spilling into Fayetteville Street. Theater in the park could be a cool way to give our performing arts organizations an opportunity to earn back some income and audience while using our public spaces. People miss the movies in Moore Square and a morning lecture series in the plaza could help engage office workers. In terms of art, play, and games, a major interactive art installation in the fall or during the holiday season. This is done across the country. They did this in Fayetteville last year. Um, so these are sort of these cool um, light tunnels and things like that that draw people down. They're really fun, they're really interactive. Um, more permanent visual installations at the plazas, I mentioned that. Um, we have an opportunity with our museums. We have great strength in our museums. Inviting them into our plazas as well is another great opportunity. And then finally, sports and sport-related gatherings. So using some of those temporary active sports facilities and plazas. So think about a temporary pickleball court. You see a picture here. This was a basketball tournament that was on Hargett Street a few years ago. There's a great opportunity there to use these spaces, get people into them, and engage them differently. We heard a lot about bringing back the ice rink downtown. And so that's something we are actively exploring, um, but that would be a, a great opportunity for downtown as well. So this is sort of some of the programming ideas. Obviously, there's a lot to this. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities here that could go in, in different directions and we'll need a lot of partners helping. So um, in our report, we have a guide. I'm not expecting you to read this font. This is just an example of potential for implementation. So it has some timeline. It has some opportunities for some of the partners who could be involved. So we wanna make sure this stuff actually happens. We wanna make sure this is not just a report, but this is something, this is a plan that's put into action. And so my final thoughts are really in these four buckets. Implementation is key. So. Uh, we do recommend that monthly working group to help implement some of these activations and programming ideas, do some of this coordination. Um, assignment of next steps is, is helpful in many ways. Uh, a lot of folks already are working on these things, um, but making sure that this gets implemented is really important for downtown. Um, the processes must be easy and affordable, right? Whether it's the outdoor dining, curbside, or small scale activations, uh, making processes easy and digestible for those who we want to use them is really, really important. And that's a key part of success. Uh, the public realm offers great opportunity, so we can bring more people downtown. We can start to get our downtown back even more than we already are by using our public realm in aggressive ways here in the near term. And investment will be necessary. So some of these things will require some investment, whether it's art installations or special event series or these grant programs um, or beautification effort. So I would encourage whether it's 
opportunity for some of the federal funds around downtown revitalization or others, there's some quick win possibility here by looking at our public realm. And again, this is part of a larger strategy for downtown and a great opportunity to bring downtown back. So um, this is just part of that conversation. We really appreciate your support, your time, um, and thank you all so much for letting me come here and, and talk to you about this. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm going to make a recommendation that we send this to the um, Economic Development and Innovation Committee for further discussion. Do you mind, Jonathan? Happy to accept it. I was going to say that all of this stuff, I am so excited about this work. If we were still at home, I'd probably be jumping around my living room with my camera off. And I'm happy to take this into our committee and, and get it moving. In, in shorts. In, I, yeah, and I, listen, I've got a full suit on today and just going to leave it there. Um, I just want to add one thing, if it's okay. Sure. The, um, as someone, you know, before I was sitting here, I was doing nonprofit work, starting nonprofits, working for them. And I have personal experience of how difficult it is to get events downtown. And I think the scaling is going to be transformative for certain groups that were not able to do it before. And so I'm really interested in that. And I want to make sure that we include the nonprofit community in that discussion. So that may be something I can work with um, for, for our committee meeting. Mm -hmm. Another thing, um, you mentioned the museums. I mean, I, I really think when we do this um, group that meets, getting the Museum of Natural Sciences, the Museum of History, the Museum of Art, CAM, like, it needs to be all-encompassing. Um, the area outside um, the Museum of Natural Sciences and Museum of History, I mean, they're, whenever I'm walking home from here, it's packed on weekends. All these families, kids, whatnot, we need to bring it all together. So, um, yeah. So we'll talk more about this, and and as you mentioned, um, Bill, implementation is key. So that's what I want us to focus on. I don't want us to focus on going through this report all again. I want us to focus more on what are the next steps and how do we implement this, and getting some advice from staff. But also, I think what we can do in a committee is invite some of those key stakeholders in who can be part of the discussion. Thank you. Okay. All right, anybody else? Okay, thank you, um, Bill, very much appreciated. Okay, we will, I'm gonna have to learn how to use this again. We'll adjourn for now and we'll be back at one o'clock. Thank you.